I'm Aaron Fisher, uh, and welcome to the Unstructured Meshing Technologies uh, section um, of AppFest. Uh, so uh, I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, the discretization side of Unstructured Meshing. Uh, and Mark is going to be talking uh, specifically about actually you know, generating these meshes, uh, which is a, a hard problem just in itself. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so in particular, I'm going to be talking about finite elements. Um, I work on a, a, the FF team, the t-shirt here. Um, uh, so finite elements um, are a good foundation for large-scale simulations. Um, uh, they're really well, they're backed by well-developed theory. Um, they, uh, the finite element method really uh, uh, has, does a very good job of representing all the richness um, and uh, theoretical backing of uh, partial differential equations. Um, uh, these uh, finite elements naturally support unstructured and curve linear grids. Um, you'll see uh, some, you know, you'll see uh, lots of interesting uh, pictures uh, in the background uh, of these curve linear grids, uh, so you can represent uh, the field equations on these um, on these really interesting higher order grids. Uh, they support higher order finite elements, and these get these higher order meshes, uh, which uh, give you a sort of increased accuracy. Uh, for the amount of compute you spent uh, to get uh, answers. Uh, in particular, they increase the uh, flop to byte ratio uh, as well, which is very, very powerful for uh, sort of modern supercomputers, which are really, really um, uh, the memory bandwidth limited. Um, and they're applicable to a very wide variety of physics. Um, they support what we call the entire uh, Duram complex in a very uh, sort of natural way that uh, mimics the um, the uh, partial differential equations um, involved. Um, the uh, this is just a, a really fancy way of saying they support um, all of the uh, partial differential equations you run into in your usual uh, physics courses. Uh, in particular, uh, like I mentioned, um, I work on the uh, the MFM team. Uh, modular finite element methods. Uh, we put together um, a C++ library uh, that's highly scalable uh, for solving uh, these uh, finite element methods. Um, uh, the, um, uh, it's an open source library. You can find it on GitHub. Uh, and uh, you know, it supports uh, all the usual things you need in a finite element library. Uh, got your, yeah, you know, all of your zoo of elements, uh, triangles, quads, tets, prisms, hexes. Uh, uh, it supports arbitrary order on all of these uh, different um, kinds of mesh elements. Uh, and you can do curve layer um, elements. Um, you can see the uh, logo in the background. It's you know, got this, uh, this sphere uh, um, in uh, not too many elements sitting on there. Um, uh, again, it supports the entire Duram complex, so all, all the types of physics you'll need. Um, uh, it supports adaptive mesh refinement, uh, and nerves geometries, um, which help you generate um, meshes uh, with, uh, with, uh, with these curvilinear, uh, with these curvilinear elements. Um, but probably one of the most powerful things about it is it integrates with um, a lot of the libraries that you're going to be seeing. Um, uh, in the numerical track here, uh, because uh, discretization is only one piece of the entire problem of sort of setting up a simulation. Um, uh, so uh, this integration with these other libraries sort of gives you a, a unified way of solving the entire problem through through a library that's linked up to all of these other powerful libraries. Um, for instance, we we integrate with. Um, you know, Hyper and SuperLU for linear solvers, and Sundials for nonlinear solvers, uh, Visit um, and uh, GLViz for visualization. So this uh, this kind of gives, gives you a one-stop shop to um, to represent and solve your entire uh, entire simulation problem. Um, uh, like I mentioned, it's uh, highly scalable, so it runs uh, on you know on a desktop computer. As you're going to see, all the, we're going to have a, an example of running in a uh, browser window. Uh, that way, hopefully, you'll be able to follow along with uh, uh, all the way up to the largest supercomputers in the world, based on uh, you know the GPUs that uh, you know we've recently got them running um, on uh, you know. Uh, uh, 
Sierra uh, and, um, and and the like through the ECP program uh, that has recently uh, back through. Uh, and again, it's got some it's a native uh, sort of in situ uh, visualization in GeoViz um, that also supports Visit if you're more familiar with that uh, visualization package. Um, okay, so I'm going to run through a quick example. Uh, the uh, so we run through the uh, Laplace equation, uh, the del squared uh, equals one um, on on a, on a mesh. And so I'm going to show you just sort of just how easy it is to get this set up um, using the MJAP library. Um, so in C plus plus. Now you don't need to try to squint and see this code. I'm, I'm going to zoom in on these pieces. But um, to, in order to solve a finite element problem, you just set up a mesh. Um, uh, you need to set up what's known as a finite element space. So this is going to be the space of, uh, of elements sitting on the mesh um, that uh, are going to you're going to be able to represent the uh, partial differential equation that you're going to going to be uh, solving um, on. Um, so if you're familiar with finite element theory, this this won't be uh, won't uh, be out of place for you. Um, you're going to need uh, you know some uh, uh, solution to represent your uh, you know field um, the solution on um, and uh, some what are known as linear and bilinear forms uh, to represent the pieces of your partial differential equation. Uh, then you'll need a solver. Uh, that has got an internal solver uh, that we're going to use here. Uh, so this is uh, to handle the linear solution uh, that you get out of uh, the situation uh, that you're handling. And then finally, you're going to want to visualize the result. So let me go, go through this uh, sort of piece by piece, right? Um, so uh, first thing we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to get the mesh. Uh, so in this case, we're loading the mesh from the file. Uh, so we've got this, um, this mesh object, and you just pass it a file name, um, and, uh, and you can load the mesh. Uh, and then we're calling this uniform refinement. Oh, actually, let me pull out a pointer here. There's a pointer. Uh, we're calling this uniform refinement uh, 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 method, um, and we've got a little bit of crazy math here. But basically, we're targeting fifty thousand elements. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna re refine each each element up uh, uh, as num the number of times to to, to get to fifty thousand elements. Okay, so now we're developing uh, uh, defining the finite element space. So in this case. Um, if you're familiar with finite element theory, again, you'll you'll uh, this will this won't be out of place. Um, this uh, uh, so this is the finite element uh, uh, space that we're uh, defining things on. Uh, so you define it, give give it the order of the elements that you're um, you're looking at, and this is uh, a user defined parameter. So this is an arbitrary order code, um, and then we pass the uh, this the the mesh into this and get our finite element space. Okay, so now we're going to get our vectors um, and our solution, our, our solution and the um, linear and bilinear forms, which we're going to use to get matrices and vectors uh, to to solve. Right. So we we create a linear form. This is the B. This is our right hand side. Uh, we're creating this this grid function, uh, which is a um, uh, representation of the the solution. So this is x. This is the uh, the, the variable we're going to be solving for. Um, and then we make a bilinear form uh, that has um, it's uh, on the diffusion operator. Um, so that's this is this is the representation of del squared in our partial differential equation. Um, and then we uh, we sort of finalize this bilinear form, and from it we can get a matrix. Uh, which will let us do the uh, uh, matrix vector solve, which is on the uh, next page here. So um, in this example code, we're doing the matrix vector solve with a precondition card conjugate gradient. Uh, we're not actually you know, inverting the matrix. Um, uh, this is a serial code, um, so uh, 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 this code runs without any external dependencies. Um, however, if you wanted to do a parallel solve, um, you could uh, call on the hyper um, and use uh, something like um, AMG uh, to, um, to uh, precondition the solve. 
Uh, but in this case, we're just doing a, a Gauss-Seidel -Gauss smoother um, and uh, passing it the matrix and vector, um, telling it to uh, target 10 to the minus 12 uh, in uh, accuracy. Um, yeah, here. And then finally, um, we're, pat we're uh, passing, passing uh, the results into the visualization. Um, GeoBiz is running um, as a server in the background, and we're just passing it to a socket. And that's it. Uh, so that's, that, that's, that's a code. That is a simulation code uh, built um, uh, on top of MDAM. So it's really uh, it's less than 100 lines, but really maybe a dozen lines of, of things that we um, you know, actually had to, had to do in this case, the rest of its comments and uh, a few switches and options. OK, so that was a serial code. Uh, but uh, MFM is uh, highly scalable, um, so I wanted to show you the parallel version of that code as well. Um, so uh, in, in MFM, to go from a serial code to a parallel code, it really is um, uh, just as simple as using the parallel versions of the objects and just having the understanding that um, you know, each, uh, each processor is going to have some of the data. Um, in the domain decomposed way. So the first thing you'll need is a parallel mesh. Its, domain, it's, uh, its domains are decomposed uh, across various different processors. Um, the uh, domain decomposition in here, um, by default in MFM, uh, is, uh, is uh, passed off to uh, a library uh, to handle this domain decomposition. Um, you need a parallel version of the finite element space that knows that the different degrees of freedom from the different elements live on different processors. Um, but this, these are, you know, these work in entirely the same way as the serial versions. You just have a par finite element space and a par mesh uh, that you're going to uh, set up instead of the uh, serial versions. Uh, you'll need. Um, you know, your par grid function for you to, to represent your solution on and your par linear and par bilinear forms. Um, again, they just need to know that the uh, degrees of freedom um, are living on different processors. Uh, you'll have a parallel assembly operation that'll give you parallel matrices and vectors. Um, in this case, because we're running in parallel, all of our matrices and vectors will be uh, hyper matrices and vectors. Um, so that's the, uh, 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 those are the matrix unit vectors that uh, we use in parallel in MFM. So you'll have to use hyper uh, when you write in parallel. Um, and then we're going to do a parallel linear solve. Um, and in this case, we're going to use um, uh, uh, AMG to, to handle the solution, uh, to handle preconditioning of the solution. Uh, so it'll be highly performant. Um, you'll, you'll learn more about uh, hyper's AMG uh, in, a, in a future class. Um, this is uh, just a good demonstration of the, the linkage between um, MFAM and Hyper. And then finally, you'll do visualization in the same way. Uh, GLBiz is set up to do parallel visualization, and it handles this domain decomposition and knows, uh, knows uh, uh, how to uh, stitch everything together. Um, again, this is highly scalable. Uh, again, with minimal changes, we've gone from a serial code uh, to a uh, parallel code. Um, and this, this build, uh, of course, depends on Hyper and uh, Metis, which was the um, uh, parallel decomposition software that uh, decomposed the mesh for us. Um, so this was one example of a, a quick code. Um, so if you go to the MFEM, uh, MFEM webpage, mfem.org, um, do we have a bunch of examples? Uh, uh, so this was EX1. Um, and you can uh, look at uh, you know maybe twenty or so uh, different examples of different codes like this that highlight uh, different features of MFEM um, and also uh, highlight um, different uh, physics uh, and different differential equations um, that we solve in MFEM. So this is a good place to get an idea of. Um, uh, the kinds of things you can do in MFEM. And uh, they, the example codes are actually a really good place to start if you have a problem that you're trying to solve uh, that looks like, um, like one of the problems in here. Um, you can adapt, adapt, uh, adapt that to a code for yourself. OK, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead um, and give a demo. Um, you can go ahead and try to follow along um, on Binder. Hopefully, the server is not too. Um, 
uh, to overloaded. Um, the, uh, one sec, let me see if I can get this. Um, I, I'm currently, I'm running this uh, locally um, on my machine, um, so I, it should, uh, should hopefully run um, without any trouble. Um, so what we've, what we've done here, um, like I said, MDUM runs you know, on a variety of machines from desktops to uh, supercomputers. Uh, we've actually got it up and running um, in uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, we have Python bindings, uh, so you can, you, can, you can get in there. Um, uh, if you can't follow along now, I'd recommend going to the, um, this link uh, and uh, taking a look at uh, this um, sort of later on in your own time. Uh, but basically, I'm going to run through example one and a couple of quick changes just to give you an idea of sort of how malleable these objects are um, and how easy it is to, um, to maybe update one of these codes. Um, so again, we're, uh, we're solving um, the diffusion equation here. Um, and uh, I hope you, uh, you all can see this. Uh, wait a second, maybe you can't. No, oh, no, you can't. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, so this is MFM example one. We're solving the diffusion equation with the homogeneous uh, de clay boundary condition. Uh, it creates uh, this AX equals B problem and then, and then solves it with a Gauss side all smooth it just like we did in EX1. So if we run this, go ahead and restart and run the code, it should die, of course. Uh, I'll try it. Nope. Okay. Well, maybe uh, maybe I'll just move on then. Okay. Well, why don't I? Uh, I'll, I'll run you through a couple of quick, quick code changes, and we won't unfortunately be able to run it. But um, so, in, in particular, this uh, this this particular problem is um, is running quadrilaterals. Um, uh, to, you know, we could, we could take out a, a uniform refinement. Uh, but one thing I was gonna go ahead and, and show you and, and add here um, was uh, a little bit of uh, adaptive mesh refinement. Um, so we're taking the mesh and refining a list of elements here with just a couple lines of code. Um, uh, and, and here you can change the, um, uh, the order of the problem uh, very quickly. Um, and so you can, uh, you know, uh, set up uh, some adaptive mesh refinement and um, quickly uh, just refine a few of the elements where you need uh, a little more fidelity um, and to, to uh, lower the error of the problem. So uh, I'll go ahead and move on, however. Fortunately, this notebook paper did not end up working. Okay, so um, uh, just to uh, uh, moving forward, um, uh, one of the major applications that MFM uh, was built to uh, deliver on um, was um, AL shock hydrodynamics. Uh, so this uh, uh, this is um, uh, the kinds of uh, the the kind of uh, simulation that you use to simulate things like pipe bombs. Um, uh, you know, uh, blast waves and that sort of thing. Um, so it was built uh, on this code at Lawrence Livermore called Blast. Um, again, using um, MFEM um, and Hyper. Um, so there's this this code um, at Lawrence Livermore um, that we use to uh, to to uh, uh, to uh, run these simulations. Um, it's uh, being set up as a sort of next generation code at the lab to do that kind of work. <coughs> Uh, so uh, blast models um, shock hydrodynamics um, using uh, higher order finite element methods um, in both the Lagrange and remap phases of uh, AL. Um, so if you're familiar with AL codes, um, arbitrary Lagrange, Eulerian codes, um, 
uh, basically there's a Lagrange phase where uh, the, the, you do the time evolution and uh, you allow the mesh nodes themselves uh, to move with the fluid. Um, and then uh, you're going to go into a remap phase where you're going to relax, you're going to relax the mesh um, into a better configuration for solving on. Um, and you have to evect material across the, uh, the mesh elements. Um, so you can see this sort of this process happening where we're, we're actually um, relaxing the mesh back, back to the initial configuration. However, we've, we've kept the, um, uh, the solution uh, uh, to the uh, PDE um, the same as we've relaxed this mesh uh, back into this better configuration for solving on. Um, so uh, this shock hydro, hydro code, um, you know, uh, relies on this, this, uh, this sort of AL approach. Um, and you have to be able to, uh, these are the equations you, um, uh, you, so I'm gonna get a pointer back. Uh, so you're solving uh, momentum conservation, mass conservation, energy conservation, and an equation of motion um, on, on all of these things. Uh, typically with multiple materials, uh, there's a t uh, tends to be um, a lot going on um, in these simulations. Uh, um, so uh, you can see that MFEM is uh, really set up to uh, do uh, this um, uh, at scale. Um, so this is, uh, you know, a, just a, a demonstration of, of what this looks like. This is actually um, running uh, uh, in uh, pure Lagrange mode. You can see the um, the uh, mesh elements are getting uh, quite, you know, sort of twisted up um, in there. Um, so. Uh, uh, the uh, sort of high order uh, curvilinear elements are really, uh, uh, you know, showing their um, their uh, usefulness um, sort of in this uh, this uh, shock tube problem here. Um, the uh, uh, so uh, I just want to make the point that these high order finite elements have a sort of excellent strong scalability. Right, you can really scale, uh, you know, as you go higher and higher order, um, you can really scale problems out to larger and larger supercomputers. Um, so um, you can see um, this, this, this particular uh, problem, we are scaling um, out to over 100,000 uh, cores um, on, uh, on a very, very large um, supercomputer. This is running um, uh, another shock, uh, shockwave problem called setout. Um, um, and as, as you can see, the higher the order that you're running, um, you know, we're running from Q2, Q4, Q8 to Q16, the farther out you're actually scaling, right? You see these start, these curves start to bend over uh, earlier with, uh, you know, Q2 elements than they do with, yeah, you know, Q8 elements, for instance, right? You can see even the Q8 is starting to uh, bend over a little bit here, whereas the Q16 is still going strong, right? Um, and the other, th the other point I want to make is, you know, you, you get more flops per, uh, per memory, more flops per memory um, uh, access uh, at higher order as well, which is very useful for uh, running on GPUs, uh, which are extremely flop intensive um, and you're constantly fighting the memory bandwidth. Um, so this is just a, a, a video uh, representing this, this ale uh, thing that, uh, that I mentioned before. Um, and there's a, uh, a, uh, some recent work uh, by some colleagues of mine uh, uh, setting up uh, what, we, what we call um, this uh, target mesh optimization uh, 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 sort of protocol. Uh, for being able to sort of untangle these these meshes um, and push them back into um, uh, into these uh, you know nice 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 configurations in in you know small enough steps that you can maintain uh, the solution uh, accurately. <clears throat> uh, and uh, you know finally, I want to I want to mention uh, again. Um, we, we support uh, two paths of visualization. We've got our sort of internal uh, GLVIS. It's a very lightweight um, path to visualization. Uh, but as I mentioned before, uh, we have uh, Visit, 
which uh, we, we have uh, uh, ties, tie-ins to visit, which is sort of a Livermore's flagship visualization package. Um, and so uh, it's got a lot of um, data analysis and, 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 and stuff like that baked in. So if you need a little more than just looking at it, um, uh, recommend uh, grabbing visit and uh, giving that a spin with them. Um, so the uh, one one thing I, I mentioned earlier is that MFEM uh, supports uh, adaptive mesh refinement. Um, so you can see uh, it's uh, you can see a couple of these adaptive adaptively refined meshes uh, in um, uh, right here. Um, so it supports two different kinds of adaptive mesh refinement because we have uh, this zoo of elements. We've got these triangular kinds of elements and quadrilateral kinds of elements. Uh, so for quad elements, um, uh, we, uh, we only support non-conforming um, uh, uh, mesh adaptation, um, where you actually have hanging nodes um, in the mesh. Uh, for triangular elements uh, and tets, um, we do support conforming uh, refinement, where um, you know you, do, you never break uh, and never have any hanging modes um, as well. Uh, so uh, just to give you a sense of, you know, this is a randomly refined uh, mesh with uh, like these non-conformal elements. Um, and so, you know, you, you've got a whole bunch of structure um, that, uh, that, that uh, arises um, in, in this non-conforming um, uh, uh, mesh refinement. Um, we've got this variational restriction approach, with, uh, which basically lets us still represent um, the uh, field equations um, on these adaptively refined meshes uh, smoothly, right? So you don't see a bunch of stair stepping um, in this in this solution here. Um, we're still maintaining um, the accuracy even across these um, uh, these uh, hanging nodes, right? There's there's no mesh artifacts uh, uh, that are arising due to that. Um, and so this is sort of the payoff you get uh, by going uh, by going to AMR, right? You get a smaller amount of error uh, for the same number of um, unknowns at any given order. So uh, in order to, you know, to get the accuracy you need, you've got sort of two levers now, right? You've got uh, what order you're going to throw out the problem um, and uh, you know, how many elements at sort of the local area that you're interested in, you're going to throw out the problem. So you see this shock problem here. Um, and you can see, uh, you know, we're throwing all of the elements, you know, as many of the elements as possible, right at the shot, right where all of the action of the um, the uh, simulation is. Um, so you can see uh, this in, you know, in video, uh, doing this, uh, you know, in an adaptive way, um, uh, you know, across, uh, uh, you know, across time, right? Uh, so you can auto automatically get, uh, you know, sort of a, this. Uh, additional accuracy per uh, per element of commute. Uh, just a uh, you know just a note on scalability um, in parallel. Uh, uh, we've uh, you know we've scaled our AMR implementation out to four hundred thousand um, CPUs. So this scales out to as large as supercomputers we can find to run the problem on. Um, uh, and uh, so before I go, I know we're kind of running out of time, so I'm going to fly through some of this. Um, I wanted to, rep, uh, to, to mention the C project. Um, this is a project um, in the Exascale Compute project. Um, this, was the, this was the vehicle we used to get MFEM running on GPUs. Um, uh, but it was a broader, broader effort than that, actually. Um, so we put together a, a library called LibSeed that um, other finite element uh, 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 codes are actually using um, to uh, handle the discretizations um, on GPUs. Um, so, uh, so the the work of LibC, the allowing uh, these these codes to run on GPUs, is going to you know, uh, it, it should uh, impact quite a few finite element libraries. Um, we've got some results. These are actually relatively old. Um, but uh, uh, basically, uh, these results are showing that uh, we've got both uh, we've got um, M M you know, sort of running uh, at you know 
orders two to fourteen. Um, and as you can see, um, as you uh, you know, you can run on more compute nodes as you get out uh, to higher and higher orders, um, and you get more and more performance as you go higher and higher order because you have more uh, uh, flops uh, per DOF um, and flops per memory read. Um, so up, up until about order eight or so, um, you get just more and more efficiency uh, in utilizing the GPUs. Um, so uh, just to close, um, I want uh, I just want to say that uh, you know so higher order methods are, show a lot of promise um, for high quality simulations um, on exascale uh, platforms. You can get a lot more uh, information um, if you go to mfem.org. Um, we have a pretty active web page there. Uh, if you want to learn more about BLAST, um, you can uh, find that on LLL's computation page. Um, if you want to find out more about SEED, uh, SEED has its own uh, uh, page uh, uh, on the xscaleprojects.org. Um, um, there's a lot of ongoing uh, R&D, right? So we're, um, we've done a lot of porting work uh, to get, uh, get MPEM working on GPUs. Um, we do have it running on Summit and Sierra um, at this point, uh, but there's uh, there's still more work to do. Um, so we're we're constantly adding more uh, support for different um, partial differential equations um, on GPUs, for instance. That's one of the one of the large things we're working on. Um, we're we're doing a lot of work on matrix-free methods. Um, these methods are particularly powerful on GPUs because they have um, they they require less memory. Uh, memory motion, um, and so you get even more flops per memory read uh, uh, if you can go matrix-free. So we're making matrix-free versions of a lot of our uh, integrators for uh, different partial differential equations. Okay, so with that, I think uh, my, my time's about up. Um, I want to go ahead and hand it over uh, to uh, to Mark Shepard, uh, who's going to talk to you uh, about meshing. Is there any questions? Uh, here we go. For the uh, non-hanging node refinement, uh, does that maintain aspect ratio as you refine? I'll, uh, I'll answer yeah, so, that. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. We'll, we'll let you have that one. <laughs> but, um, I'll... Uh, Ask that question again after I finish my discussion because the non-conforming mesh adapt, or excuse me, the conforming mesh adaptation in MFEM is Pumi, which is what I'll be talking about. Hi, uh, so I'm wondering, has MFEM been used for like a really large scale um, turbulent simulation like DNS or something? Uh, so we've we've done some Navier Stokes simulations, and we have a Navier Stokes mini app. Um, we are currently working on uh, 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 some turbulence models so that we can do RANs and LES as well. Uh, that's uh, sort of sort of coming up. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. yes one more. One coming second. At least. We're running around with the mic. Thank you. Oh, gotcha. Um, you had mentioned, I think, in one of the slides, the like two visualization options, and one of them was visit. Um, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if pair of you falls on, into that category, or uh, we don't. We don't currently have. I don't believe pair of you currently has support for uh, MFM meshes. Uh, that's something we could look into. Uh, the only two options we could, that are currently supporting MFM are, are GLVis and visit. Just to clarify that a little, uh, MFEM is focused on higher order meshes that are going to be curvilinear in, in almost all the applications they apply because of large deformations or whatever. And if you wanted to use Paraview for that, you're going to have to go through some extra work to do a lot of decomposition of those elements because it's going to use interpolation on lower orders, whereas the particular package, the GLVIS, and the work they've done on add-ons to visit support that directly. So that, that's why those would be the most more appropriate visualization tools for if you're working with MFEM because of the higher order. Okay, that's a great answer. Thank you. Any other questions? 
Okay, thank you, Aaron, and Mark's up. All right. Thank uh, you all. Thanks, Aaron. Um, <laughs> oops, I, I've got to be careful. I'm causing feedback. Um, I assume you can hear me. I, I don't shouldn't. I shouldn't speak as if I don't have a mic on. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going to back up a little bit and talk a little bit more generally about the unstructured meshing developments within the fast math. Uh, SIDAC math, uh, Applied Math Institute. Um, so to, to, uh, there, there's a number of contributors, and although they, they've advertised this part as we're going to talk about PUMI, there's actually like 10 different packages um, and 10 different tools. MFEM is a very major tool and represents a whole analysis capability. The other tools I'm going to be discussing are more if you will, bits and pieces. They're bits and pieces because in, in many of the applications one, where one wishes to work on, you, need, you already have analysis capabilities, but they're not effectively using unstructured meshes on massively parallel computers. So you pick up these tools to help you address that, either to do mesh adaptation to provide an unstructured mesh infrastructure to your analysis code, to support dynamic load balancing, or the assignment of, of uh, across various compute uh, uh, pieces in your, your heterogeneous architectures. So the parts, the tools I'll be talking about are, are the tools of that type. Um, so just, again, more generally, why do we care about unstructured mesh methods? Well, they have distinct advantages. They, they certainly can support dealing with very complex geometries. I'll show examples of realistic geometries that we have to deal with on a daily basis with these tools, things like RF heaters in a, in a fusion, toc in a, a tokamak for fusion uh, energy systems. Um, so, the, you know, we can automatically generate the meshes, try to do a block structured mesh for something like that. I think I'd go a little, well, I know I would go insane. I don't know about the block structured people, but it certainly would be addition. It's not something where you can press a button. Um, they can provide the highest accuracy per degree of freedom, but I'm, I've got to go through the disadvantage column so that, yes, you know, they can do the best as possible, but... There's, there's butts associated with that. Uh, it's easy to adapt meshes in a variety of ways um, and get anisotropy, et cetera, out of that. Um, and in fact, in, in, in a numbers of applications where we have well-defined workflows, we can literally automate the simulation process such that people do not have to you know, think about meshes or mesh files or a lot of the pieces. Right? So what are the disadvantages and why do we need to be developing tools uh, that help people out using on, to use unstructured meshes? Well, they, they require much more complex data structures, particularly if you're going to want to do something on these damn GPUs that are just a pain in the butt. Right? Um, they require a much more careful consideration of controlling the meshes in terms of quality, et cetera. Depending on the application, depending on the discretization technology, some are much more sensitive to no than others, but you, you have to account for these. Um, also, with unstructured meshes, you have, just in general, because you want all this flexibility, you're going to pay the price of having more variation in the mesh in that, and that's going to often aggravate iterative solvers, which you have to apply iterative solvers when you're doing really large problems. So again, extra work we get to do for that. Um, and there's also the issue of, of, of really getting the maximum efficiency on, on the massively parallel computers and with GPUs. You really love tensor product types of elements, quads and hexes. Well, you're not going to get quad, purely quads and hex meshes by a pressing button mesh generator. Uh, you might be able to get a lot of them, but you're not going to get it that fully. All right, so 
the goal of the, the fast math tool developments in this area are to provide uh, the tools that, that people can use to address uh, their, their needs in these areas. Um, as, and I've already mentioned this now, you know, we're do, the way we do that is develop these tools. They're, they typically operate through uh, interfaces, APIs. Uh, that we try to address specific technical gaps as, as they're seen in the applications. And then realistically, they're still not that trivial to use. So in many of the cases, we get heavily involved with working with the actual developers of the codes that they want to integrate these tools into. Right, so what are the development areas? So the first is, of course, the uh, analysis codes themselves. So you. MFEM being the, the flagship of the activities in this area, um, in that, that it's really a very strong and powerful library, a library that's easily extendable uh, to bring in new physics, new discretization technologies, et cetera. We do have other uh, analysis codes in there I'll, I'll mention uh, on the next slide. Uh, performant mesh adaptation, being able to adapt your meshes, uh, Typically, the tools we're talking about will be for conforming mesh adaptation uh, and doing that on parallel computers with, on already distributed meshes. Uh, of course, if we're changing the mesh, we're going to have to deal with the fact that there's, we need to uh, gain load balance. So there's going to be tools for load balancing and task management. Uh, is not, you know, have to account for how you're distributing not only to the, if you will, to a node level, but on the nodes to the GPUs and CPUs on the node, et cetera. Uh, more recently, th there's been uh, a number of application areas where we want to combine particle methods uh, with, uh, with uh, continuum methods, if you will. Uh, they may be doing something as simple as uh, changing the right-hand side, or they may be changing both the right-hand side and left-hand side of the, of the continuum systems, but you'll track particles where there'll be trillions of particles on meshes with billions of finite elements, and you typically want to be, you know, go back to the field representation ultimately for certain parts. However, to get the physics right, you've really got to be down to to the particle level on certain aspects of that. So we're developing tools for that. There's also work on unstructured meshing uh, methods in ML, would be it to actually do mesh generation or to uh, have specific UQ technologies that work effectively on unstructured meshes. And finally, the, there's specific work on in situ data analysis and visualization for unstructured mesh applications. So I mentioned, you know, they, 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 this talk is sort of advertised, we're gonna talk about PUMI, but as you'll see, there's, there's really a variety of things, uh, tools on the analysis side, there's the MFEM code, but there's also other codes, one that's being used for uh, very specific uh, mechanic, solid mechanics problems uh, and uh, the, another one is you know, the PASTA code, which is a, uh, a Navier-Stokes code with, with a lot of different turbulence models, and et cetera. So if you're, you're attacking fluids problems and you want a, a more mature code that has turbulence models, then you might want to look at PASTA. Um, but that's not going to be an easily extendable library in the way that MFEM is. So if it, you know if it can solve your problem, great. If it doesn't, well, you're not you know, you're, you're not going to want to crawl inside of it and 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 uh, change that easily. We have tools that provide mesh infrastructures. Um, the Pumi Mesh Adapt is is one that we'll see specific slides on. That's been developed over the years. Um, and runs effectively on CPUs uh, and multi-core machines. It is not effective on GPUs, uh, and there was really no way to, without dramatically changing the structures, to work well on GPUs. So there's, an, uh, there's a uh, tool called Omega H, uh, which on some of the applications we work with, we just call it Omega because Omega H is a bad word to them. 
Um, I'll mention that a little later. Um, and that is specifically designed for execution on GPUs where, uh, if you will, at the PUMI, PUMI level, you can do things very nicely on an entity by entity level. Whereas if you want to use a GPU, there's no way that's going to work. You have to blast everything and say, I do everything at once. Well, I'm doing unstructured mesh adaptation. Blasting that is really a difficult thing, but that's what Omega-H uh, uh, addresses. Load balancing tools, there's the Zoltan and Zoltan 2 libraries uh, that are, uh, uh, come from Sandia that do an, can do initial partitioning as well as dynamic partitioning along the way. Uh, the extra pulp is also uh, more generalized graph structures and used for task management in addition. And then there's a specific tool, EdgePAR, um, uh, developed at RPI that is used for fast dynamic load balancing uh, procedures. And then it was to support the unstructured uh, PIC calculations, we have a, uh, an infrastructure, which I, sorry, I skipped when I was up uh, under the unstructured mesh infrastructures. Pumi pick, which combines a, a distributed mesh data structure with a distributed particle data structure. If you look at most PIC codes, they say, well, I've got trillions and trillions of particles, so my primary distributed data structure is the, the particles. And they say, well, we got a mesh. Well, we'll just put a copy of the mesh everywhere. Problem is, on some problems we're looking at, we're up to 92 billion elements, and that doesn't fit so well on every copy, and every G, you know, having a copy of that on every GPU. But of course, you create huge headaches when you're trying to distribute both the mesh and the particles and keep them related. Uh, and that's what PumiPIC addresses. And we're developing specific applications uh, built based on that, where there's existing codes that have the, if you will, serialized meshes that we're making them work with fully distributed meshes. Right, so talking a bit about PUMI, which stands for Parallel Unstructured Mesh Infrastructure, um, it supports the mesh as a hierarchy, a topological hierarchy. It maintains the linkages of that to the original domain definition. If you're going to want to have automation in processes, that is, well, I have a problem I wish to do. Here's my problem, whatever you mean by that. Press the button to make a mesh. That means the problem needs a very specific and proper definition of the domain that the computer can understand because the, you know, you, it's got to communicate with the mesh generation capabilities. Uh, so in, in uh, this is fundamental to these mesh infrastructures that you have a higher uh, level geometric representation in terms of a topological model. Not necessarily all the geometric detail of it, although you need to interrogate that. Um, we won't get into that level of detail in this discussion today. Um, so then, uh, then it con uh, supports conforming mesh adaptation. Uh, we'll see a couple of slides on that. Um, and operations and fields on the mesh. That is the fact that you need to, as I'm adapting a mesh, transfer fields from the mesh before adaptation to the mesh ab after adaptation. Right? And we've already mentioned the tools that, that uh, we're working, we've been developing to support that. So Aaron mentioned, I'm going to talk about mesh generation. That's uh, um, I don't think you really want me to talk about mesh generation. People want tools that generate meshes. The last thing you want me to do is tell you how those tools work. It'll uh, put you all to sleep. Um, and, in, in, and in reality, there's a lot of there's good tools for that. Um, in, in the work we do, we tend to interact with two uh, well uh, tools. We, uh, uh, for those that want to ins uh, use open source software, the GMesh software is probably about the most sophisticated uh, set of tools out there for fully automatic mesh generation. There are some other open source tools. In many of the applications and things I'm going to show today, we actually use the uh, commercial software from a, a company called Symmetrics, which happens to make component-based mesh generation as opposed to 
just a mesh generation package. Um, uh, and we use that uh, for a variety of reasons, one of which they're a spin-off from our center, so we, we know how their stuff works. Uh, but they, they're, in fact, they, they have a lot of capabilities that, that a G-Mesh and other things don't have. We do have tools to exercise the mesh control, so we'll typically have a CAD model, generate a mesh with the CAD model using G-Mesh or Symmetrics, then inside the applications, we'll apply tools that will do adapting the mesh, although uh, both G, well, particularly Symmetrics has tools that can also adapt the mesh uh, in many of the applications. Since we're embedding the mesh adaptation into the open source analysis, that will be at the PUMI level. Um, but we, we can use a or error information error estimators to say where and how to improve the mesh execute that on a fully distributed mesh um, using a range of tools, moving the mesh around. You saw examples of that with MFEM, where the mesh followed uh, what was happening with it, um, uh, dealing with curving the mesh, but also being able to make it coarser or finer in very general ways using cavity level refinement operations, including anisotropic adaptation. Uh, control of element shapes is uh, by adding capabilities to this to say, well, I can do what you asked me for, but are you really like the result of that? Uh, we won't get into full depth on that, but all these things do execute in parallel. So the, the idea of, of uh, generalized mesh adaptation is as simple as you identify I want to make the mesh finer in an area, for example. So I have a mesh, I want to split these elements. Um, you can do it in specific ways that tries to maintain the shape of the elements, but when you're working with simplex elements, it's actually provable that you can't fully control that the way you can with, it, with just 2D triangles, um, and you often don't. You know, you don't. You, know, you may think really while well, I want are as much as many equilateral uh, tetrahedron as, as possible, if you will, but in fact, most of the times you're solving problems have anisotropy in the physics. So you like actually like the mesh to reflect some of that anisotropy to the point. To a point, you don't want it to destroying your mesh. Uh, the other advantage of these methodologies that I'll talk about here is the fact that we can coarsen the mesh by doing localized collapse operations. Again, they can be anisotropic. And unlike many of the, the non-conforming mesh adaptation procedures, the coarsening procedures we're talking about here can start with any arbitrary mesh. It can make it coarser. It can't just go refining or unrefining. It can coarsen over the, the, what the initial mesh is. So this is just a, a couple of pictures of examples, uh, aerodynamics ones and blood flow examples of work that's been done on meshes. I think the biggest one we've still done today is 92 billion. We've got to you know, push that up because you know, that's not really problematic to get it much larger than that. Uh, and that was for C to, C, uh, a real CFD calculation with active flow control devices that is now, uh, they're, they're putting that to, to specific use. Um, also problems with mesh motion or, or uh, moving objects or deforming objects, uh, so an example shown on the bottom there. Right. We also support uh, uh, the adaptation of curved elements, that's, it's, a, it's a much more tedious operation, becomes much more expensive, particularly if you have very coarse meshes. It's not, it's not problematic if your, your meshes are reasonably fine because then you can just curve, but if your meshes are coarse and you start curving, things turn inside out and you've got to deal with that and be very careful with that. All right, so that's mesh adaptation. So there's a there was a question related to mesh adaptation and control of shapes. So the specific procedures we're using here, they're actually driven by you give it a mesh metric field as to what you want the mesh to adapt to. So over the mesh, 
you'll define, think of it as defining it at each mesh vertex. You'll give it a mesh metric field that says, I want my elements to be of this, this size and this anisotropy, if you will. Uh, and the mesh adaptation procedures strive to do that. But I say strive because you're working in a very unstructured environment dealing with geometric constraints of mesh and that. So controlling element shapes becomes hard. And in some cases, you may re reject an operation. I may want to ask for a coarsening operation in particular. Uh, and I'll decide after I try to apply that, I really have not controlled the shape of the element well enough. So to hell with it, skip that coarsening operation. So that, that's the, the, uh, not necessarily a highly satisfactory answer. Uh, but that's the, the answer of the state of the art of what you can do with this these types of tools when you want the flexibility of being able to do whatever you want with the mesh. Right? Um, so moving on to the area of load balancing and dynamic load balancing, uh, differentiation in those two terms is that you may, you're ready to start off an analysis, you've, you've got a mesh. It may, may be distributed already, may not be distributed, but you look and say, well, if for the calculations I'm going to do, I know I can mimic and understand what my load and load distribution is going to be on that. Is it balanced? If it's not, I'll run a procedure. Uh, 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 well, the examples I'll hear, use here are either with Zoltan or the Zoltan 2 package um, to load balance that. The dynamic load balancing is typically things you apply, well, now I've, I had load balance, but I changed the mesh, or the physics of the problem has changed, so the computation over here is much more difficult. You know, I might have a, a solid mechanics problem where I start having uh, constituent relationships that get more complex to evaluate as I get into certain regions over here. Anything that breaks the load balance, you uh, might want to apply load balance. Right. So I already mentioned the tools there, Zoltan, Zoltan 2, Enchpar, and Extra Pulp uh, that, that are been developed for that. Right. Um, in addition to just the standard load balancing, if you go out to some unit, let's say your node, uh, but then on the node you might want to be uh, being very architecture aware uh, as to how you want to distribute things in the architecture where it has to account for the processing units as well as their ability to communicate data between them uh, as well as communicate between the higher level units if you're talking about the, uh, the inter the uh, internode communications right? so the Zoltan and Zoltan 2 packages have collected a number of partitioners so the, the fastest and simpler type of partitioners are based on, on coordinate bisections methodologies and there's a, been a number of specific tools that have been developed for that. Another popular uh, procedure, particularly uh, on tree-based meshes that you might uh, want to uh, see when you do non-conforming, excuse me, yes, non-conforming mesh adaptation are space filling curves. Uh, the most rigorous in terms of detailed load balancing while trying to minimize communications, and I should have mentioned that, you know, not only do I want to get the load equally distributed, but I don't want to do it such that everybody's got to talk to everybody all the time because I'm going to just die in communications. You, tr you do that to, to minimize communications. The graph-based partitioners are are designed to try to do that as well as possible. Um, so tools like uh, Parametis or PT Scotch are very effective for supporting that. Um, now, as it turns out, often we have conflicting things or multiple criteria we want to account for. So not only do you have sort of basic graphs, but you have these things called hypergraphs of various types that can support various forms of combinations of links or the meanings of links and, and doing that. So uh, a simple example is in higher order finite elements, if we have variable p 
pee across the mesh, variable order of the mesh, I need to try to account for different degrees of freedom, have different types of, of demands on computation and communication, and hypergraphs can help me do that, uh, as well as saying, well, one, one, you know, I, I have, I'm worried about degree of freedom balance, but I'm also worried about element balance, because at one point I'm doing element level calculations only, and the other part I'm doing degree of freedom based out uh, calculations. Right. EngPAR was defined to be uh, as, a, as a tool to try to do things very quickly in that it redistributes using diffusive methods, which can is not a, an ideal approach if I'm just doing arbitrary load balancing starting from no knowledge. But if you're doing things like an adapted mesh or things where you know, the, the things are evolving but not dramatically changing in each step, then these diffusive methods work fairly well. So now we use a hypergraph to drive the diffusive load balancing procedures. Okay. So what do we do with some of these tools? So I'll, I'll just give some examples here uh, where I've now, uh, in, in the diagram at the, the lower right there, I've, I've exaggerated where these individual little tools come in, the mesh data structure, mesh adaptation procedures, linkages to the geometric model, uh, and everything goes. Whereas, uh, if you will, uh, in that picture, MFEM is now just a little, the, the, the far left lower box. You know, in terms of lines of code and not, that's not, you know, and, and where the computation's done, that's not fair. But in terms of data support and everything, it's, it's, this is demonstrating how all the various pieces fit, can be fit together. Right, so we've a, a number of example applications uh, have, we've combined these various tools within Pumi and Zoltan, et cetera. Uh, MFEM being one of that, the PASTA code, FUN3D, which is a finite volume code for fluid problems, Proteus, which is a multi-phase finite element code, Albany, which is a finite element, another finite element framework of a form um, that is uh, part of the Trilinos package, ACE3P, which is a higher order finite element code for electromagnetics, uh, M3DC1, which is an MHD code for being used for core plasma simulations, Nectar++. So it's been, we've, these tools have been combined with a number of capabilities. Just some very quick examples. Uh, here's some uh, a application to the electromagnetics. Uh, this application here is with what they call Felix, which is a a version of, of uh, Albany that's used for land ice modeling uh, using very specific techniques. Uh, a more recent application that sort of combines everything is these RF simulations where you have these, if you, at the top uh, right you see a, an RF antenna uh, which has a lot of geometric detail some of the details, such as the Faraday grids, are very important. Bolt heads are not, so tools like symmetrics, geometric um, uh, cleanup tools are used to very quickly defeature it. Uh, we then bring those CAD models into the overall models of the tokamak that we are going to get from the, the fusion communities in terms of uh, EFIT files, etc. Um, we then combine that with physics information on flux fields uh, because we, we don't necessarily need to discretize the entire core for a calculation, etc. So you can see that the combi combinations of tools get rather sophisticated in this entire process. Um, and then, of course, we, we will we'll, we'll couple that with mesh adaptation to control the mesh to most accurately, in this case, do the RF simulation. Right. Finally, talking about supporting particle and cells, the Pumi pick uh, is a mesh-centric view. Although our biggest data is going to be the particles, our 
first view of distribution is based on what the fields are going to be on the, and that will be at the mesh level. Uh, so we need a mesh level uh, data structures that are uh, in this case GPU oriented for being able to execute pick and field operations. Uh, and then we need particle data structures that are going to match to that. So in this particular, in PumiPIC, Omega or the Omega H software is the main uh, data structure. As I mentioned, when we talk to the Fusion people, they don't like us to say the word Omega H because that's actually an instability that says your uh, Fusion reactor is going to shut itself down real soon because it's not happy and it's going to burn a hole in its wall. Um, so uh, uh, we just call it Omega when we talk to those guys. Um, but it's, it does support conforming mesh adaptation. Um, it's very well suited for GPU application. It happens to build on top of Cocos for uh, portability. Um, you've, you probably have some, had some lectures on Cocos or will have lectures on Cocos, but it's uh, just a way to try to deal with the fact that each of the GPUs wants to do things its own way and they hide that from us and uh, we use their APIs. Right? So we've done specific advances to that. Now in terms of the particle data structures, we sh store the particles based on the mesh that is, so the particles are per mesh entity um, and we've uh, developed some specific structures, although uh, we find the Copacabana data structure developed under the uh, uh, ECP program is probably going to be the most effective overall for doing that. So with those infrastructures we've developed the, uh, the operations for supporting PIC calculations uh, as well as uh, the field solves on that so we can you know, support the basic particle push operations, all the searches uh, which is going to be in, in, for the unstructured meshes, we're going to use adjacency-based search, which is natural for this. We have various specific ways of distributing the mesh to minimize communications during a push and, and, do, max, and do the bulk of the, you know, hopefully all the inner process communications between pushes when we have to do that anyway for the field solve, setting up the field and doing the field solves. So with that, we're developed, there's an edge plasma code, XGC, um, which we've developed a version for a subset of their, their physics um, based on this new data structures. And uh, we are slightly outperforming them, uh, which is, we, we view as a, a big success because that's on a distributed mesh where their mesh is not distributed. Another version of the code uh, capability being developed, uh, code being developed, building on PumiPIC is a version of Guitar, which is an impurity transport code, um, which now we've got on a fully unstructured 3D meshes and can do effective jobs of now doing supporting simulations of their diagnostic processes, etc. Now in closing, you notice I didn't try to do any demonstrations of these tools, et cetera. Uh, there's too many of them and there's too many pieces to them. Um, but if, uh, if you're specifically interested, uh, Dr. Cameron Smith will be available during the speed dating. He's gonna be available virtually. But in addition to that, feel free to follow up um, if based on developments you're doing, if you're doing unstructured mesh developments and any of the tools we talked about appear to be potentially useful to them, contact Cameron or myself and we'll see if we can link you up with the right people to see if some of these tools would be of, of specific uh, use to you. Okay. And with that, I'll close the presentation. Are there any questions? Yes.
What, what type of mesh deformation algorithms do you have? Deformation? Yeah, uh, mesh motion. Oh, mesh motion. Um, so the, there's, there's probably four or five different ones, but the, you know, we support various AL methodologies within that. They're, they tend to be very application specific. Um, so in, in most of the applications we've been developing, it's ones where standard ale alone doesn't, doesn't do the whole job, right? In an ale method, uh, you've got a mesh topology and you, you move things around and can slide it back and forth. But if I'm doing a, a deforming geometry problem, I've still got to, my, my deformations have to be consistent with that. And sooner or later, elements will turn inside out. So in any of the things we're doing, we often do a fairly simple mesh motion because we assume we're going to get to the point that fair, at some point, we're going to want to um, adapt the mesh, either because the element shapes are there or, wait a minute, Errors indicators telling me I need a fine mesh here, and oh, by the way, I don't need it over there anymore, right? So we're usually using combinations of things. Now, if you're just doing mesh motion, then there's optimization-based procedures uh, that can be applied in quotes globally, um, uh, but they're very, uh, yeah, well, they're quite expensive. They, they can be <laughs> more expensive than solve steps, because they basically have solve steps within them. Um, those same methods we, we often apply more locally when we have really hard problems on the curved meshes. So we'll apply that at the cavity level and say, okay, outside of here, we're, we think we're all right, but in here, let's see if we can do a real good job. So that's, that's a long-winded answer that uh, says there's a lot, could be a, a variety of pieces. Thank you. Yep. Are there any other questions? Do you have links to uh, the source code for the components in the uh, FastMath uh, ecosystem? I'm not sure I understand the question. Do you have uh, links to websites for the source code for oh, all these yes, components? Yes, yes, Okay, would you mind sharing that um, at, at a later point? It yes, we, uh, yes. Uh, hopefully Cameron's listening. <laughs> yeah, I got you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah we'll make that available. Yeah. I have a question on the first part of the presentation, again on MFEM. So, like, I don't know if Aaron is also on the call, but I was curious, like, um, how is Lipseed related to MFEM? So I'm from University of Colorado Boulder, I've heard of Lipseed, but I'm not sure how it links to MFEM. Yeah, I can, I can take that question. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, yes, Aaron. Yep, you can. Yeah, so um, Lipseed has been, so you can actually optionally uh, integrate Libseed with MFEM. You can basically turn on the Libseed MFEM and it gives you access to uh, Libseed's, what we call integrators, uh, so which gives you bilinear forms that use the, um, the, the Libseed uh, uh, integrators in there um, to run things on the GPU. So the, the sort of the fastest uh, integrators on the GPU uh, are, come from our, from our Libseed integration. Um, so uh, I hope that, does that answer your question? Yeah, that, that does, thanks. Yeah. I, I, I'm gonna take a, 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 an orthogonal cut at that, right? So if uh, you, you ask, if, if somebody asks me if I, I wanna do something, do I wanna pick up Lipseed itself or do I wanna use NFEM? So if, I, if I, I'm bringing in something and I know what my equations are and MFEM has all the tools I need to bring that in there, I'm gonna go MFEM. If I'm gonna to wanna to do some trickier stuff and I need to get at a deeper level of doing things, um, then I might wanna pick up and, and start looking at Lipseed. And Lipseed, you know, is, 
uh, it's probably most of, you know, well, Jed Brown's the one that's driving that. Um, and, and that works well, you know, you're going to have a lot of Petsy uh, oriented things there. So if you're going to go down to that, at that level, I, I would, you, you'd probably want to go to the Libseed level. Aaron, is that a fair statement? Yeah, Libseed is really at a lower level. So MFEM, when you work with MFEM, you work and you think about things at the finite element level. Um, you know, Libseed is really, you know, Libseed's a, a library for building things like MFEM. MFEM is a library for building things like simulations. Um, so it's just a, what, sort of one level below. That's perfect. That's what I exactly wanted to know. And I do have a second question. And I was wondering if like, and that's, uh, that's for this part of the um, presentation. And I'm curious, like, uh, if the mesh adaptation or mesh refinement hasn't been done for isogeometric uh, like meshes, so like doing like key refinement, not insertion, those kind of stuff, or well, okay. So if, I, if I'm writing an isogeometric, a, a true isogeometric code, your data structures need to account for the fact that your degrees of freedom, what. Well, if you write an isogeometric code and you use so many repeated nodes that it's a p-version finite element, then I don't know why you did it. <laughs> so if you write an isogeometric code and want to take advantage of what it's best for, you're going to be basically splining over a, a range of elements. So uh, to me there, the, uh, I, I've really got to think about what my data structures are that, do, that does that well. Um, so yes, those, these tools could certainly be used to do mesh control with them. But by the way, isogeometric simplex elements, <laughs> well, isogeometric methods and simplex elements don't like each other. I mean, there's there's some people that are trying to do that are trying to crack that nut because they, you know there's, there's there's always the constant mismatch that. I can generate great meshes on anything as long as I can use simplices or at least a lot of simplices or at least some simplices. Um, but if you want your really slickest analysis, it's got to be all hexes or all quads. And not only that, if I want to use these me the, the isogeometric methods and everything else, I, you know, if I've got a quadrilateral mesh, every corner has to have four elements. If it doesn't, then I'm going to have a headache. You know, so yeah, it, <laughs> there's no simple answer to that the, that question in my in my mind. Well, I thank everybody for their attention and. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, you can absolutely sign up uh, to speak with uh, either Mark or I uh, or Cameron perhaps uh, in the SB dating sessions later tonight.